Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I've been wowed today by some spectacular research by uh, wonderful investigators here. So I feel like I'm uh, bringing coals to Newcastle. Um, you certainly have a spectacular institute uh, in electrophysiology for many years, and uh, it's just growing uh, still more. So it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, we've been interested in uh, the Brugada syndrome for a number of years, and uh, I've uh, been fortunate to have had a, a Japanese investigator named Hiroshi Morita, who has done some beautiful studies uh, with us. Um, and uh, uh, for me, it's been very helpful since my career has been a foot in the dog lab and a foot at the bedside. Uh, for these uh, almost 40 years, uh, to have an animal model that has helped explain a number of the clinical observations. Uh, so that's what I'd like to share with you uh, today. Brigada syndrome, as you all are aware, uh, first reported by uh, Pedro and Joseph uh, some years ago, characterized by ST elevation in the right precordial leads, uh, dynamic uh, ST changes uh, uh, modulated by autonomics, uh, sodium channel blockade enhances the ECG findings. Interesting, sudden death at night due to ventricular fibrillation. Uh, it's a, a significant problem, though a small percentage of all sudden deaths, but quite real. Um, and uh, many patients have totally uh, structurally normal hearts. Pediatric, uh, symptoms are rare at uh, a young age group and, and come on as individuals grow. Interesting uh, male predominance um, um, and possibly related to testosterone. High prevalence in Southeast Asia um, precipitated by uh, a number of well-known things, but particularly fever, um, uh, parasympathetic stimulation, and uh, interestingly, uh, uh, sleep, and probably related to the increased vagal tone. And to my knowledge, the ventricular storm that occurs in Brugada is the only ventricular arrhythmia that I'm aware of treated with isoproterenol. Mm -hmm. Uh, catecholamine stimulation and attenuated uh, as one would predict by uh, exercise. There may be delayed uh, activation within the ventricle to produce uh, late potentials. Um, uh, VF can be induced. The SCN5A mutation occurs in probably 20, maybe 30 percent of these patients. Uh, and uh, there's uh, other genes that are uh, well established. Uh, SVTs uh, may occur in uh, a reasonable number of these patients uh, as well. Uh, this is an interesting ECG of a patient uh, before and after castration. Uh, the, the typical ECGs in the right precordial leads uh, reflecting right ventricular outflow tract um, uh, changes, as I will uh, emphasize subsequently. This patient developed uh, testicular cancer and underwent castration, and you see the profound alteration in the ECG changes, obviously suggesting, again, the role of testosterone and why there is significant uh, male predominance. Uh, as I indicated, um, the um, uh, prevalence appears to be particularly great in Southeast Asia, and uh, interestingly, because of that, a number of the uh, local country, uh, the, the individual countries have had specific names to this sudden death at night, uh, night terrors, uh, some of them have been uh, called the voodoo death, but uh, fascinating, uh, a, a relatively long history for a clinical syndrome that's relatively recently uh, described. Obviously, it's been there all these years. We've only more recently recognized it. Uh, this is a circadian pattern of uh, VF episodes in a number of these patients uh, showing the predominance uh, during the sleep, as I indicated earlier. Um, 
the typical uh, ECG changes and uh, um, I guess not during sleep, he was at his office, uh, but had uh, a ventricular tachyarrhythmia going on to uh, uh, what appears to be ventricular fibrillation and the profound ECG changes in the uh, anterior precordial leads. Uh, there's been a, a committee that uh, has written a consensus report uh, chaired by <coughs> Arthur Wild to suggest that there are three types of ECG presentations uh, as indicated here. And it's this type one uh, with the uh, uh, J point and ST elevation and uh, ST segment elevation with terminal T wave inversion that appears most ominous. Uh, and either spontaneous or induced by sodium channel blockade identifies individuals that appear to be at increased risk for ventricular tachyarrhythmias, while those with uh, type 2 and 3 uh, significantly less uh, risk of sudden cardiac arrest. So uh, diagnostic cri criteria have been established uh, based on uh, that type 1 ECG and then some other parameters as well. The uh, changes are dynamic, as you can see in these uh, four ECGs in this particular individual. And uh, when the changes were most profound, had uh, an episode of uh, BF. Um, uh, one other example with uh, the typical but very significant ECG changes. Uh, in the anterior precordial leads. Uh, as I suggested, temperature plays a very important role. Uh, so here, for example, uh, two ECGs in the patient febrile and afebrile uh, and had uh, an episode of DF while in a hot tub uh, when his temperature indeed was uh, elevated. Uh, another example of an individual with uh, VTVF. We explored this in our animal model, and um, the elevated temperature shortens refractoriness and allows for phase two reentry to occur in the outflow tract. I'll, I'll uh, show that uh, in, in just a moment. While when the temperature uh, drops, the uh, APD and refractoriness prolongs, and the reentry can't continue to cause the ventricular rhythm. That's one suggested mechanism. Um, this is uh, unmasking the ECG changes with the silicone, which is a sodium channel blocker. Uh, as you can see, uh, the difference here. And uh, this individual also had late potentials prior to silicone uh, and uh, BF induced by uh, electrical stimulation. The big argument in the literature today, primarily between two camps, Sylvia Priori who says the response to premature stimulation is not predictive, and the Brugada brothers who very strongly say it is predictive. And uh, uh, at times in, in running a symposium, I put them on uh, uh, debates, and uh, it, it gets a little acrimonious as uh, each of them are certain their side is correct, and very probably it's someplace in between the two. Um, Family history of sudden death <coughs> occurs in some of these individuals. The SCN5A mutation is an autosomal dominant, as I indicated, in 20 or 30 percent uh, of these uh, individuals. Uh, interestingly, the SCN5A mutations uh, have uh, been found in a cluster of uh, inherited uh, abnormalities, uh, long QT, Brugada, and uh, con uh, conduction uh, system, progressive conduction system disease, uh, depending upon where and, uh, on the SCN5A the mutation occurs. And uh, in this particular study um, uh, published by Sylvia, uh, had a patient uh, who uh, she thought demonstrated uh, uh, all three of these uh, abnormalities. Uh, and uh, let's see, let me slide. Here, uh, here, for example, uh, is a uh, uh, long QT uh, patient. The ECGs didn't uh, replicate very well, but long QT3, and then after flecainide, uh, 
looking like uh, uh, Brugada syndrome, the, the, the same patient. Um, there have been uh, a number of uh, uh, different abnormalities uh, demonstrated in this uh, SCN5A uh, gene, uh, generally representing a, a decrease in the uh, sodium current. Uh, but there have been other genes that uh, have also been uh, recognized. And uh, there is now a, a constellation, much like long QT is now up to 12 different uh, genotypes. Uh, the, the list is growing with uh, Brugada syndrome as well. Uh, this is an example of uh, the, the transformation of a patient uh, who ostensibly has long QT3. Uh, as you can see, the very characteristic P wave changes of long QT3 with a very long ST segment and uh, uh, then a very late T wave. Uh, and uh, this individual given uh, mixilatin, which uh, significantly shortened uh, the QT, uh, presumably in the long QT3, while pilsiconide uh, here creating uh, what appears to be the uh, Brugada ECG changes. Um, uh, Will has investigated uh, groups of patients with and without the SCN5A mutation, and it's now very clear that patients can have Brugada syndrome and serious uh, clinical uh, phenotypic changes without having the SCN5A uh, mutation. Uh, so uh, uh, they compared the ECG uh, changes in these uh, patients and basically found that there was some conduction delay uh, in those who had the uh, mutation uh, compared with those who, who didn't. Uh, but there was no difference in the frequency in this group of patients of uh, VF or induction by uh, uh, electrical uh, stimulation. I'm going to come back to the SCN5A uh, gene because uh, we've uh, shown some interesting uh, findings in that population. Most recently, in heart rhythm, uh, Morita, the, the Japanese fellow I spoke of, uh, published a paper uh, without me. He's back in, in Japan and looked at the differential effects of cardiac sodium channel mutations on the initiation of ventricular arrhythmias in Brugada. And uh, interestingly, because one of the points I'm going to make is that ventricular arrhythmias occur commonly in the right ventricular outflow tract. This becomes very important. And he demonstrated that patients without the SCN5A uh, genetic abnormality often had PVCs in the RVOT area, so they would have uh, a left bundle and inferior axis, while patients with the mutation had PVCs of both right and left bundle branch morphology suggesting that they could occur from uh, uh, different parts of the heart. This becomes very important as I'll establish mechanistically as to what is the cause of the ventricular arrhythmias. And it may be much like atrial fib, which is a mixed bag of mechanisms that what we call brugada is actually a mixed bag of uh, ventricular arrhythmias and they're not all the same uh, mechanism. Uh, relatively recently, a couple of years ago, Charlie Anselovich uh, described uh, a new entity uh, uh, or a new genetic basis of uh, uh, patients <coughs> with uh, uh, Brugada syndrome, these are the ECG changes, and showed loss of function in the cardiac L-type calcium channel with SD segment elevation. Uh, these had short QT and uh, sudden cardiac death. So now there are at least six different Brugada syndromes with different uh, genotypes, and uh, as we learn more, it's certainly going to get even more complicated. And uh, as I said, it may be a mixed bag that we've lumped into uh, one group that uh, really is not one group. So we've been interested in trying to create an animal model can and I, can I ask investigate one? some of the mechanisms. Can I ask Your one, one quick question? So all of them are either loss of sodium channel or loss of calcium channel function or gain of K channel. Exactly so right. do they all have short QT no. under 
baseline condition? No, no, it's a mixed bag. Some, uh, and, and, and indeed, as I showed, some of the long QT3s look like they can go into Brugada. So, do you, so, so, so do, no. So do you have any explanation for why the long QT3s have loss of sodium channel function and yet a prolonged action potential? Well, I think when they have long QT3, they have a gain of sodium channel, and it's only with the administration of pharmacologic manipulation that they then have loss of, of sodium channel function and are transformed from long QT3 to Brugada. So, yeah, um, we have uh, studied this in a, an isolated uh, uh, ventricular wedge. Uh, this is a schematic of, uh, of how we've studied. This happens to be left ventricle, but I'm going to show you uh, right ventricle. Um, this is a, a sagittal uh, piece of the anterior left ventricle, which is perfused through the LAV, and then uh, we do optical mapping. We have an old camera, excuse me, just uh, 16 by 16 array. I'm embarrassed to show such an antiquated uh, uh, piece of research here. Uh, but nevertheless, we, we do have some, uh, I think, interesting findings from it. So, uh, basically, we do uh, optical mapping on this uh, isolated uh, uh, piece of tissue. Now, to study the Brugada syndrome, we have, because of the, the clinical observations that the changes are <coughs> in V1, V2, V3 generally, suggesting RV outflow tract, uh, we have indeed studied uh, in uh, that isolated wedge uh, pieces of the right ventricular outflow tract, either epicardial or transmural, depending upon what we're interested in. And we use the following cocktail, uh, which uh, I, I need to give credit to Charlie Anselovich, who first uh, indeed uh, did a number of these studies. Um, Pilsiconide to block the sodium channel, uh, Panacidil, uh, the IKATP opener, and terfenidine, which is a calcium channel blocker, to replicate the uh, reduced sodium current and uh, L-type calcium current. And as will become very important, the concentration of ITO in the right ventricular outflow tract, particularly in the epicardium of the RVOT, uh, hence the uh, phenacidil. And with this cocktail, uh, one can create a reasonable replica of what happens clinically in the Brugada syndrome. Now, I'd like to uh, call your attention to uh, these uh, action potentials recorded from the epicardium, midwall, and endocardium in the normal RVOT prior to drug, and specifically emphasize the fact that in the normal setting, there's a, the usual notch and uh, phase two dome in the epicardium, uh, and that the APD in the epicardium is shorter than the APD in the endocardium. However, after our cocktail, things change, and uh, the epicardium now shows a very prominent phase one notch and a very late phase two dome that becomes very prominent as you see. And the APD in the epicardium is now significantly longer than the endocardium. In addition, um, and I, I forgot at the Gordon conference um, who, who demonstrated the instability of this dome. Uh, Christine, uh, what was his name? In any of Christine. Yeah. Uh, the, the, this, the, the presence of this dome is very unstable, or relatively unstable. And presumably, when the notch becomes significantly greater, calcium is not activated and the dome is lost, as you see here. And very importantly, in, in virtually contiguous areas of the right ventricular outflow tract, some will show the very long APD, big notch, late dome, 
while other areas show the loss of this dome and therefore a short APD relative to the endocardium, and virtually uh, contiguous uh, areas. Now, we think that these changes give rise or can explain the ECG, and we've got an ECG expert here. Uh, John, you tell me if I'm, uh, if I'm wrong here, but uh, indeed, with the presence of the very deep notch, there's presumably conduction uh, from endo to epi, which could give rise to the ST segment elevation. And then with the big late dome uh, and a longer APD here in the reverse direction, uh, be responsible for the negative T wave. Uh, in, in any event, that, that seems a, a reasonable explanation for the ST elevation and T wave changes that occur uh, in, uh, in the Brugada syndrome. So, the changes predominantly occur in the right ventricular outflow tract, and we see very significant heterogeneity in, this, uh, in the epicardium. Uh, as you can see uh, with uh, the changes in the uh, action potential, some with a, a big notch and big dome, uh, others much less so. And uh, the uh, suggestion originally by Charlie Anselovich and replicated by us is that areas with the dome are able to electro electrotonically activate areas without the dome and cause what's been called phase two reentry. Here, the reentry occurred too quickly and was blocked, but if it is uh, able to continue, this then appears to be responsible for the polymorphic uh, VTVF that occurs in uh, Brugada syndrome. Now, Similar findings have been replicated in patients with uh, body surface mapping, and, and I, uh, uh, Yorm and I have talked about this. Uh, it would be wonderful to use ECGI in uh, these patients, if you haven't already, uh, to uh, be able to demonstrate this even more conclusively. Uh, but, uh, for example, uh, if one does a, a ST voltage map, uh, it's in the RVOT area that has the most profound uh, elevation in, in voltage. And uh, you can replicate some of this by moving your ECG uh, to uh, the third intercostal space rather than uh, fourth. Uh, and um, with catheters, uh, some of the conduction delay that is typical in, in patients with Brugada syndrome uh, has been uh, demonstrated. So here, for example, uh, a catheter in the uh, RBOT area showing delayed activation uh, at this site and after sodium channel blockade, enhancing this delayed activation even more. And I'm going to come back to that uh, uh, subsequently in my uh, uh, presentation. Uh, as I indicated, um, many of the PVCs, I used to say all, but I can't anymore after that paper by Morita, uh, but many of them uh, appear generated in the uh, RVOT, uh, so uh, an inferior axis with a uh, left bundle uh, characteristic of ventricular arrhythmias uh, in this area, as you see here, initiating uh, polymorphic uh, VTVF, and indeed, uh, uh, as uh, Morita indicated, this uh, was SCN5A negative uh, individual, uh, a cluster of the ventricular arrhythmias in the uh, right ventricular outflow tract in, in a, a journal I won't mention. That was supposed to be a pun, sorry. Uh, so the clinical observations, uh, uh, right bundle with ST elevation in leads V1 through 3, ST elevation manifest at the RVOT, delayed potential recorded at the RVOT, and uh, uh, as I'll come back to, probably in the epicardium and ventricular arrhythmias commonly occur in that area. We wanted to see whether different parts of the right atrium responded differently 
to our cocktail that we use to make Brugada syndrome, so that in the simultaneous bath, we study tissue from the RVOT and tissue from the right ventricular antero inferior area exposed to different concentrations of our cocktail. And basically what we demonstrated when the right ventricular antero inferior area and RBOT were exposed to low doses of the drugs, the endo APD in the antero inferior area remained longer than the epi, but the RBOT was far more sensitive to the low dose of drugs showing uh, big notch, big dome, and APD much longer in the epi compared with the endo. And with high dose of drugs, it was only then that changes occurred in the uh, antero inferior right ventricle, and that dose then lost the dome in the RBOT. So it's very likely that the high concentration of ITO in the epicardium of the RBOT separates it from the rest of the right ventricle. And uh, that's why uh, most of the data would suggest that uh, Brugada syndrome occurs in the RBOT and in the epicardium of the uh, RBOT. Ventricular arrhythmias in our animal model were far more common in the uh, outflow tract than in the antero-inferior uh, right ventricle. Uh, and here, exposed to the same drugs, no arrhythmia in the uh, uh, right ventricular uh, uh, inferior area, but RBOT, uh, short run of polymorphic ventricular arrhythmia. Um, and uh, indeed, uh, this uh, outflow tract area has something uh, special about it. Uh, as I indicated, there can be very significant heterogeneity. So here, for example, in a low dose of drugs, uh, action potential in this area shows uh, uh, big notch dome. In this area, similar, but now with an increase in the concentration of the drug, uh, one sees that this has maintained its uh, notch and dome, while this site, virtually contiguous, has lost the dome and this now electrotonically can activate uh, the area without the dome, uh, so-called phase two reentry, and uh, cause uh, ventricular arrhythmia. Uh, similar changes uh, appear to occur in, in patients as well. Uh, this shows uh, from our animal model the uh, heterogeneity that I've just shown you. I won't go over it again. Uh, but uh, uh, this is now uh, a patient uh, with the uh, significant ST elevation, J, uh, J point ST elevation inverted T wave in the RVOT area seen here, but in the antero inferior area of this patient, showing much less change compared with the RVOT. So the patient data appear, or we replicate in the animal model what happens clinically that it is the RBOT that is so sensitive uh, to our drugs and shows major differences in uh, the patient uh, mapping uh, as well. Um, um, so as, as I've stressed, we think that uh, it's the uh, electrotonic propagation or, or electrotonic activation from areas uh, with the dome to areas without the dome that then can give rise to uh, PVCs and uh, uh, ventricular arrhythmia. Um, the heterogeneity appears to occur in the uh, epicardium compared with the uh, endocardium. So in here, for example, it is our uh, patient uh, on the right and our Brugada model on the left. Uh, APD long in the epi compared with the endo, and uh, if one looks at the QT, local QT in the outflow tract of the patient, and uh, suggests that that's roughly the same as the APD in our animal model, the QT is longer 
uh, in the epicardium of the RVOT than in the endocardium of the RVOT in our patient, which again replicates uh, the animal model. Uh, T-wave alternans commonly occur in patients with uh, Brugada syndrome, and uh, we were able to replicate uh, such T-wave alternans in our animal model as well. And very importantly, the action potential changes responsible for the T-wave alternans in the animal model are just in the epicardium not in the mid-wall and not in the endocardium. So it appears that the, uh, and the, you just look at the uh, epi changes here, uh, the mid, uh, very little, if any, and certainly nothing in the uh, uh, endocardium. Um, and, and it's probably the concentration of ITO, as I uh, suggested, that occur, that is present in the epicardium uh, responsible uh, for the ventricular arrhythmia. And uh, a suggestion in our patient of uh, re-entry in the outflow tract uh, responsible for uh, ventricular arrhythmias. Uh, the uh, ECG changes in the animal model um, can be spontaneous as uh, one sees here and if uh, uh, one superimposes uh, epi action potentials, that's where all the changes occur, uh, and not in the mid wall or the endocardium. And uh, such heterogeneity occurs in our patients as well with Brugada syndrome. So this is a body surface map showing uh, ST segment elevation at the RBOT in virtually contiguous areas, showing uh, very marked and very little ST segment elevation, or a very uh, short and very prolonged QT in uh, very close areas uh, in the RVOT of patients with uh, Brugada syndrome. Uh, we wondered whether the phase two reentry can uh, be actually recorded in the scalar ECG. You got to take these following tracings with a little bit of a grain of salt. Uh, but uh, here, for example, is the uh, notch electrotonically activating areas without the notch and producing uh, a little jiggle in the um, uh, ECG in this uh, animal model, uh, enlarged over here. Um, in a patient now with the onset of the ventricular arrhythmia here, blown up, uh, here's where you need a grain of salt. Uh, a suggestion of a, of a T-wave notch, uh, even more profound uh, in this particular patient. I do think with the proper ECG recordings, one might be able to indeed record uh, phase two re-entry uh, from the uh, surface. And uh, I would think, uh, uh, Yoram, that uh, your equipment might indeed be able to do that. As I indicated, T-wave alternans occurs in uh, patients. This is a patient febrile uh, who had uh, Brugada syndrome uh, with uh, clear uh, uh, T-wave alternans. Um, sometimes they're two to one, as seen here. Sometimes they're random. Uh, th these are in patients. And uh, we're able to, de to demonstrate uh, similar kinds of uh, uh, changes in uh, the body surface map. So uh, here, for example, um, in this beat with a, a deep T wave beat uh, in this R RVOT area and a shallow uh, T wave beat. Uh, and you can see the, the uh, alternation in the uh, scalar ECG as well. So T wave alternans in Brugada. Uh, can be precipitated by fever, sodium channel blocker, beta blocker. Uh, there may be um, uh, alternate uh, uh, ST T wave changes, or they may be ventric uh, they may be random, and ventricular arrhythmias often occur uh, associated with that. And uh, as I said, we can uh, we have replicated replicated the same kinds of changes in the animal model. Here is T wave alternans 
Here are random changes uh, here produced in ventricular arrhythmia. And uh, if one looks at the superimposed uh, action potentials, you see that the alternation is occurring solely in the epicardium and not in the mid wall or in the endocardium of our animal model. More recently, uh, uh, we've made a, a more recent uh, uh, or new observation in Bugatta syndrome. And it was based on uh, some observations by Nicholas Das, uh, who showed that in patients with coronary disease, fractionation in the QRS complex was a risk marker for subsequent sudden death. And obviously what the fractionation is representing is areas of slow conduction within the ventricle. And indeed, uh, John Boino and I were, were talking about that. Uh, uh, John made some uh, observations uh, similar to that uh, almost 30 years ago uh, in uh, dogs with uh, myocardial infarction. Uh, but we looked at our uh, Brugada population since uh, conduction can be affected in Brugada syndrome. Remember that conduction system disease can be a part of the SCN5A abnormality. We wondered whether such fractionation uh, might occur in patients with Brugada syndrome. So here's a 55-year-old male, and you can see in the blow-up of uh, V1, the very uh, fractionated uh, activation uh, seen here. Uh, patient had uh, an episode of uh, uh, ventricular tachyarrhythmia. Um, and uh, in this population of uh, patients with uh, the type 1 ECG, 115 patients, uh, 13 with VF, 28 syncope, 74 asymptomatic, all had uh, spontaneous type 1 uh, ECG. Uh, and uh, these patients were found to have a very high prevalence of fractionation. So here, for example, is the incidence of fractionated QRS uh, in these patients uh, showing uh, that the ones with VF had a much greater uh, incidence uh, compared with those who just had syncope or were asymptomatic. And uh, this shows the incidence of uh, late potentials induced VF and uh, SCN5A abnormality in patients with and without fractionation. And you see that the uh, uh, only significant difference was in uh, the, the presence of fractionation versus not in the SCN5A uh, population of patients. And if uh, one does uh, life table analysis uh, of these patients, uh, this shows the uh, uh, event-free ratio for the syncope and VF groups. And you can see a, a very clear difference in those uh, who have fractionation versus those who don't, while late potentials, uh, PES-induced VF, and mutations were not predictive. It was only the presence of fractionation. Uh, I, I will tell you I've just accepted a paper for heart rhythm from another uh, group uh, of a uh, uh, large number of patients with Brugada syndrome who show that the presence of late potentials is predictive of the subsequent uh, BTBF. And I think they're basically both showing that abnormal conduction in the ventricle of patients with Brugada syndrome is a risk marker for uh, sudden cardiac arrest. We tried to replicate the fractionation in the animal model, but of course these are normal right ventricles in, in canines. And we're not able to do it in a, a basal state, basically. So what Dr. Morita did was to put uh, a thin slice of epicardium and a piece of transmural uh, right ventricle in the tissue bath, record an ECG, and stagger the, the conduction so that there was a conduction delay between the thin slice and the transmural slice. And in doing that, we were able to replicate the uh, conduction delay uh, that uh, is seen clinically. Uh, we got battered by our reviewers of this paper in circulation that uh, how, how can you do such a thing and, and, uh, and think that you're replicating the clinical situation? Well, of course we're not. It's an animal model. But nevertheless, showing that there was conduction delay between the two slices of right ventricle 
replicated the, the conduction delay in the patients was very suggestive that it is this conduction delay that uh, is important. Well, the remaining slides, let me talk a little bit about uh, therapy in uh, Brugada syndrome. Uh, sudden death, uh, obviously, is a major problem, and predicting who is at risk is, is very difficult, uh, as I've uh, indicated. Uh, for those at risk, the ICD, because most of them have uh, pretty normal hearts, uh, virtually eliminates the sudden cardiac arrest. Uh, beta blockers are really not that helpful, particularly since uh, uh, vagal tone and uh, uh, absence of sympathetic tone appears to be a risk for ventricular arrhythmia. But nevertheless, a number of uh, approaches have been used. Uh, so uh, reduction of uh, outward currents or boosting the inward currents. Uh, so for example, quinidine in a relatively large number of patients as an ITO blocker has been effective. And it may be one of the rare situations where we would use clinic, uh, quinidine uh, to treat ventricular arrhythmias. Uh, atropine, uh, denopamine, silostolol, uh, 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 PD inhibitor. And as I indicated earlier, electrical storm uh, is treated with uh, continuous infusion of uh, isoproterenol. And ablation, uh, which I'll come back to, has been uh, uh, suggested. So uh, here, for example, is uh, a patient who was treated with uh, quinidine with a uh, reasonable significant reduction in the ST changes uh, uh, that uh, occur in the outflow tract here blown up. You can see uh, those changes. And uh, Bel Hassan and uh, Sami Viskin from Israel have a, a relatively large number of patients with so-called idiopathic VF that have been followed for many, many years who have had uh, a very good response to quinidine. And I suspect a number of them have uh, Brugada syndrome. So here, isoproterenol showing the uh, profound amelioration of the outflow tract uh, uh, changes. Our Brugada model, similarly, uh, here, for example, prior, uh, this is after our cocktail, showing long APD uh, in the epi with a uh, notch dome uh, is restored more or less to normal with uh, isoproterenol uh, administration and similarly, uh, suppression of the ventricular arrhythmias in the uh, animal model. Um, dispersion gets reduced in the animal model with uh, ISO, uh, as do uh, PVCs or uh, spontaneous uh, ventricular arrhythmias. Now, interestingly, um, uh, Hassegger reported some years ago ablation of the initiating PVC in a Brugada patient could eliminate the ventricular arrhythmias that uh, the patient had. And uh, we've investigated this in our animal model, and uh, th this uh, paper is in press in uh, Heart Rhythm, and basically it demonstrated that if you ablate the site of earliest activation in the epicardium, you could eliminate the arrhythmia, but ablating the endocardium did not. Uh, again, lending credence to the fact that it is the epicardium of the RBOT, certainly in our animal model, but a lot of suggested data clinically as well, uh, that is responsible for the ventricular arrhythmia. And the, the clinical implication is that uh, if you have a patient with Brugada in whom you're trying to ablate the arrhythmia, consider an epicardial approach uh, rather than uh, transmural, or, or rather than endocardium, particularly if it does not become uh, transmural. And th this simply shows the uh, uh, elimination of uh, arrhythmia in that ablation uh, model. So uh, to summarize, uh, SCN5A mutation in 30% or so, but uh, uh, calcium channel abnormalities and others uh, as well, decreasing in inward current, uh, which is then uh, 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 makes the outward current, the ITO in the RVOT area, uh, even more uh, profound. 
are producing changes in the uh, RBOT with areas of long APD, large phase two dome, areas of short APD with loss of the dome, uh, producing uh, significant uh, uh, APD dispersion or QT dispersion in patients. Difference between the epi and endo being responsible for the uh, ST segment elevation and the T wave inversion. Uh, AP, uh, APD or action potential heterogeneity at the epicardium giving rise to the T wave alternans uh, as you see in the epi but not present in mid or endo uh, with long APD areas uh, uh, electrotonically activating areas with short APD that can give rise to either PVCs or if the reentry were to continue producing uh, PTVF, that there is uh, intra RV action potential uh, dispersion, conduction delay, at least clinically, uh, probably at least in part related to uh, fibrosis. Uh, some patients have been shown to have abnormal restitution in this area uh, and uh, uh, all giving rise to uh, ventricular arrhythmia. So uh, I think in summary, the uh, in vitro canine model of Brugada, ECG, and syndrome provide insights into the mechanisms of the clinical presentation and therapy. And I'd like to emphasize the contributions of uh, uh, doctor and this doctor and doctor, uh, husband and wife, uh, Morita, Jashin Wu, and uh, John Lopshire. And with that, I'll stop. And thank you all very much. Questions to Dr. Zipes or comments to Dr. Zipes? I've been interested in the early repolarization, and, and I see a number of uh, patients who have early repolarization of the anterior chest weeds that look almost identical to the uh, gut. So far, I haven't found any of those patients who are originally yet. Think of the relationship. John, it's, it's hard to know what's normal versus what's Today and, and as you know, as, as you had found some years ago, and as Hassegare reported recently, this uh, abnormal repolarization. Uh, but they, they demonstrated it in uh, two, three ADF and the lateral precordial leads appears to identify another syndrome of, of sudden death. Uh, obviously, there are lots of patients with early repol who are completely normal and, and are going to die at 85 in their sleep. Um, and, and it's difficult to, to separate them. I think a, a sodium channel blocker challenge, if you're clinically suspicious, would be a very reasonable thing to do to try to replicate the classic uh, Brugada ECG changes and in some of these VTV apps, so you have to be careful. But it, it's a difficult call, particularly if you're sitting in a room reading uh, 500 ECGs at 5 o'clock at the end of the day. So I was thinking about the same point. You, you talk about it being a dome, but I, I'm wondering, is, is, the, is it really right to call it a dome, or is it really an early after depolarization? Is it because you get to a repolarized position where you're re reactivating calcium currents? And um, so I, I can't on? defend that uh, much more than, than what I've said. Generally, an EAD occurs a bit later, and, and it's often a, a distinct upstroke during the repolarization. But could I say that that's not a, a large EAD in, in that phase two area? No. Uh, and, and, and I suspect there's, there's a, a kind of an overlap between the concepts, uh, all related to calcium. That's yeah. a good point. Sure. Oh, yeah. EAD and the dome both have the rising phases yeah. and have calcium channels. Right. But I just wanted to make, if I may, just one comment. Yeah, sure. general comment about this. And I think, you know, together we talked about this broad spectrum of atrial fibrillation and so on and so forth. And here, also, the Brugada syndrome has a very could be kind of, I think partly because the definition is based on the ECG and it's very nonspecific. ST segment elevation can be for many different reasons. Anything that causes spatial gradient of action potential uh, voltage in the, in the heart, 
reflect on the, during the uh, plateau phase or the repolarization phase, will reflect the advanced segment elevation. And that could be ischemia because of IK ATP channels, it could be repolarization abnormalities that you duplicated with this cocktail, could be delayed activation, it causes you know, different parts of the ventricle to repolarize at different times. All of those we call ST segment elevation. So it's very, very good. And in fact, there is a, uh, one family that Arthur Wilde had that we simulated that and showed that in the same family, in the same, uh, with the same mutation, and the mutation was a very simple mutation of an insertion of a single amino acid. Uh, you can get both Brugada and Don QT in a rate-dependent fashion. So yeah. the rate comes into play also. Yeah. Oh, the rate but comes into play, the autonomics come, in, come into play, it's, it's complex. So, that's a, so, so I think when, when you try to define any, any kind of a clinical observation and, and relate to mechanism based on an ECG observation, unless you're a John Plano, it's very hard to make a specific well, That's why we need the ECGI in these that's patients. That's part of it. The other part is I think we have to understand the mechanism. The same goes to the same goes to the We just don't know. That you could do with a body surface map, possibly, is, is to look at the gradient of non uniformity. Okay, because the, 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 the potential is there in any of these things that have extra second elevation, even for sure. polarization. The potential for a uh, substrate is there. But it's got to be a big enough difference, as he was showing, between areas of long and very close together. Uh, and that's what the substrate and How big a difference do you need? Uh, you mean like 10%? I would think you probably need about 53%. <laughs> <laughs> no, in, in millisecond. <laughs> I mean, uh, Boris Sarawitz looked yeah. at this many years ago by injecting hot or cold liquids into a coronary artery to change, to, to produce a, uh, a refractory period gradient and tried to calculate uh, how much you need. Obviously that's artificial because, well, it's all artificial, but injecting coal is going to lengthen APDs much more than... The digital computer model will tell you that. I did that back in the, in the 70s. Digital computer model of ventricular fibrillation. And what did you find? And in fact, it took about 44%. 44% uh, of what? Of the difference in refractory theory of the, of the adjacent areas. Interestingly, I also had a random number generator in this model. And if the threshold was 44, you would change the distribution. And one time you'd get the arrhythmia, the next time you wouldn't. And this told me why you got the arrhythmia on Tuesday, but not on Wednesday. But that's, but that's assuming that all you have is this person with your That was the only thing we were modeling in that. And could be other complicating factors. Sure. Regulatory Such as if, if there are EADs yeah. giving rise to this these yeah. uh, dispersion. Yeah. Or, or, that's you have, gonna or you have some flight water? Sure. Yeah. So talking about other complicating factors, mechanoelectric feedback is the thing that I, I have been interested in. And I was wondering if in your experimental setup, where you have a piece of the RV outflow track and other pieces, and you can measure endo to epi differences in the duration, if there's a way to do the same experiment but load it or stretch it, because in general, APD shortened as you stress the yeah. tissue. And, and no, we didn't, but that's, uh, where that, uh, obviously it could play a role in the ventricle, but it, it plays a profound role in the atrium. Um, and actually we showed some years ago that stretching the atrium <laughs> stretched the thin areas much greater, much more than where the thick trabeculae were and produce the dispersion of refractoriness because of the differential stretch, thin areas versus thick. Is the Altman surface flow rate being caused by a, um, some prolongation in the inactivation period of some of the cells? <coughs> where, where is it actually coming from in epicardium? What, what's the mechanism? What is it? Well, th there may be two, or at least uh, one is the presence or absence of the dome, yeah. which can occur in alternate <coughs> beats. But, but what is the um, ionic oh. current system? All I've got is uh, 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 the optical maps. I don't, I don't know. I think, I think what happens there is that uh, if you have a, an SCN5 mutation that is a loss of function, then your sodium current is very compromised. Mm -hmm. And you know that this, 
sodium channels in, in cardio, in, in ventricular myocytes, has a very long uh, recovery time. So there is fast inactivation, but then also slow recovery. If you get to situ, you, you get those alternates probably at fast rate, not at slow rate. Not necessarily. No. Um, well, it has to be at a rate that if, if we exclude, if it comes from the SN trigonal mutation and we exclude calcium cycling abnormalities, which we can't, I don't know if that exists, okay. but if you assume that they are not there, then what it is is that on the background of this large ITO with compromised sodium current, you know, every other beat you have enough recovery of the sodium current to get over the challenge of ITO, but not every beat. Or you have enough recovery yeah. of the calcium current, and that's what's to causing assist, the dome. And then the sometimes dome. you don't get or, it. Or one well, other but mechanism. But it's happening, in, uh, as far as I can see, at fairly slow rates, and it, and it yeah. doesn't happen at the fast yeah. rates. That, that's what confuses me. Maybe with sufficient compromise in the sodium channel, it, this has to be computed, but with sufficient compromise of the sodium channel, even at slow rate, you can only one, get. One other mechanism, yeah. which I didn't stress, is concealed reentry. Because when the uh, dome electrotonically uh, activates another area and does it on alternate beats, you have alternate P wave changes because of the PVC in that P wave. Now that's obviously very different from the P wave alternands we talk about, but on the ECG, you're going to see T wave alternands, but with an entirely different mechanism. I don't know if you'd predict that the isoproterenol effect is through an enhanced calcium current, but do you ever try BK? AK 644 and see if that gets rid of things yeah. Don't know. in the I, model? I, I would think that might ameliorate the, the changes as well. Yeah. I really enjoyed the talk. I wonder if you could speculate a little bit more on what makes the RVOT such a unique part of the ventricles being involved in this and to be so responsive to the drugs. Yeah. Do you think it's an ionic mechanism? I wonder, you know you've done a lot of work on innervation and scenario which is ours too, but I mean, is there any difference in the innervation of the RBOT compared to the other parts of ventricle? And just yeah. an observation for being a heart surgeon is the RBOT, though, it's interesting what China just said. Of all the parts that, of the heart, that, of the ventricle, it's the stretchiest part of the ventricle. The minute you load the RV, the RBOT balloons right yeah. up, and you wonder maybe how much that yeah. might relate uh, to it. Well, certainly this uh, ITO, the transient outward current, appears to be very concentrated in the epicardium of the RVOT, and why God made it that way, you'll have to ask her. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but that appears to be a, a very important aspect because if you've got this outward current and you're blocking the inward currents, either sodium or calcium, then that ITO becomes even more manifest. That's that's as far as I can take it. As Any as innervation as differences that you look at? Or? Uh, I, I'm Sure, there are. We we looked at our RV innovation many years ago, but didn't compare it to the left ventricle. But that would be a very important thing to, to look at. Um, and it's a very interesting uh, suggestion, particularly if there were less sympathetic activation there, that might play a role as well. Yeah, that would be very interesting. Cool. Can you replace penacidil with diazoxide in the cocktail and get the same effect? We haven't tried, but I <laughs> might assume that it would. Well, only because they act on different isoforms of the KP channel, and both isoforms are present in the heart in different places. Okay, so you, I'm you wondering, got me on that. Uh, I don't I'd be interested to know if dioxide can replace panacea. <laughs> <laughs> if it's only uh, caused by the calcium channel, so there is also calcium channel reduction I, I would assume that calcium, uh, that anything that's going to affect the uh, uh, L-type calcium channel would exacerbate uh, this. So that uh, calcium channel blockers, for example, would be contraindicated in a Bugatti patient. Okay, thank you all very much. <laughs> Now shows a very prominent phase one knot and the endocardium. In addition, uh, and presumably when the notch becomes serious,
of the right ventricular outflow tract, some will be show relative to the endocardium. And virtually moments to the you, you, I've been uh, interested in the early reports so far. I haven't found any of those patients who are meridians yet. Seguer reported recently this uh, abnormal sleep. Um, and, and it's difficult to to got an ECG changes, and in some of these DTVFs, we have to early up to depolarization. Is it because you get to a repolarization? Could I say that that's not a, a large EAD in, in that? Yes, I don't comment about this one. I think, you know, together we talked about this ST segment elevation can be from many different elevation phases. We reflect that the ST segment elevation depolarizes different times. All of those are called ST segment elevation. So it's a variation of an insertion of it's, it's so, that's so, so, so I think when, when you... That's why we need the ECGI in these that's patients. That's part of it. The other part is, I think, very positive. Yeah, the potential is there in any of these things that I've asked. Uh, and that's what the substance... And how big a difference do you need? Many years ago, by injecting, obviously that's artificial because, well, it's all artificial, but injecting coal... About 44%. Uh, we change the distribution. One time you get the arrhythmia. Yeah. Oh, you have some flight bars? Sure. Yeah. So talking about other complications, shortened has expressed that yeah. such tissue. And, and no, we didn't. But seeing the atrium <coughs> stretch the thin areas. What is the, what, what's the mechanism? What is, well, the, the all I've got is uh, 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 the optical maps. I don't, I don't. Sodium channels in, in cardio. It's probably at fast rate, not at slow rate. Not necessarily. You know, every other beat you have enough recovery of the sodium current to get sufficient compromise of the sodium channel. It, this has to be computed. Uh, activates another area and does it on all. Bay K, Bay K 644, and see if that gets rid of work on innervation and scenario which is ours too. But I mean, is there any technical? It's the stretchiest part of the ventricle. The minute you load. Uh, but that appears to be a, a very important, that's as far as I can take it. As Any as innervation as differences you look at? It's a very interesting uh, suggestion, particularly if the they're channel. left. And both isoforms are present. In Open channel reduction uh, cause the uh, I, I, So that uh, calcium channel blockers.